biodiversity and all this stuff. And here you have a quite nice uh, coastal forest with Mika and Koi et al. up on the Captain Coast. So, you know, you want to work, maybe to work something like that. Uh, so understand that, and uh, that's going to make your goal way more achievable as well. And you want to kind of plan this so you can avoid some flaws. This doesn't look very nice as a coastal forest, right? Not as lush and green. Uh, so the way to kind of do this is actually um, you can't achieve this overnight and just plan stuff and then walk away. So um, you kind of want to plan it a little bit so you can have something that might look like this. Uh, so this is another planting site. This is actually outside Papa, which is quite nice. It's been always looked after as well. And you kind of planted a few things uh, more with the diversity in there as well. But you kind of want to, you know, plant with the diversity around things, having small groups of the same species, so you still can... Is, is that all right? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so you still can have some of those seed sources for, you know, having on uh, to be spread later on as well. Uh, but it would be really cool if the planting site actually looked like this. So you kind of have to manage your site. Maybe not just you know plant it and then walk away, but actually come in two or three times a, uh, a year. Just look after the plants, do a bit of weeding, uh, you know, trim the surrounding bush around certain some species as well, uh, and then maybe even plant some things that might be missing or have died back as well. And this might actually need to be done for the next 10 to 15 years. And of course, light is always a big problem as well when you're actually having a planting site. So if you actually remember the first slide there with all the dominating uh, lemon wood, uh, you know, there was no light pretty much on the ground there. Like that, you know, it looks pretty dead. Um, so what we've actually done here, this is um, a Mahwe dominated forest. Uh, you can see not much of diversity around in the back of there, uh, like around there. But what I did here was actually trimming back the camp a bit. And this is just after basically a summer of all the light coming down here as well. Uh, so you suddenly have all these ferns and native grasses, cabin trees and things like that popping up. So kind of look after that for a while. Um, <laughs> um, oh, now we go too fast. So that's actually what it looked like before we actually trimmed the canopy. And here, uh, basically the same site, just a little bit further down as well. That's the, just the following summer. And then two years later on. And suddenly three years later on. And now we actually have things like Caprosma grandiflora, Prefusia, uh, cabbage trees, and all these native uh, tussocks and sedges growing up down here at the bottom as well. So light is actually one of the bigger things as well. Uh, and if you're working with something from the beginning, so this is actually a planting site up uh, near Wanganu. Uh, so what you can see here is they've actually left gaps up here as well. Uh, so they planted a lot of stuff, uh, left these gaps, which, um, you know, you can plant these. All right, three minutes left. Uh, um, I kind of lost there for a moment. Uh, yeah, so leave gaps like that so you can plant these light loving species later on, like Rimu and Ikao, because these guys, they need a light, but they also need a shelter as well, the lateral shelter. So this is why surrounding bush is really good to have as well. Oh, actually, just to quickly say as well, so what I'm doing up there is actually I'm trimming back lemon wood around the koi koi as well, and you kind of want to have these natural gaps, as you can see there. Oh yeah, and again here, so basically you need a shelter but not the shade, so this, ah, Mika is struggling a little bit down here under all the kawa kawa growing up around it, so that kind of needs to be a little bit, bit of a work on. And seed scattering and dispersal, that's kind of cool thing, to collect seeds and stuff like that. Uh, see a bunch of stuff here, native passion fruit, tea toki, pigeon wood, dianella, etc. And this is not exact science yet, and in a lot of places where we don't have these guys, seed scattering is a kind of way to actually speed things up as well. You can see how much of Nikau has actually been just dropped by a couple of pigeons of one favorite perch here. And they just <laughs> And here we actually have uh, Titoki and Pigeon Wood all growing up from seed scattering that we've actually done on Miramar as well, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, some of our hard-art color, all 
volunteers are actually collecting candidate poop as well to kind of actually help some of that stuff as well. And if not, we kind of soak everything in water and kind of pretend to be the candidate stomach or belly as well. <laughs> and if you actually want to plant some more cool stuff, uh, epiphytes, grasses, vines, things like that, uh, it's like more of a challenge. We have some people climbing up in the trees here, like Mark, for example, who's sitting here back somewhere. And um, we plant them up there, which is kind of cool as well, or just without the ladder, just trying to hang out like a little monkey. Uh, Astelias, things like that. Really cool stuff. And again, keep going as well. Flip several species that do need the shelter, but still light as well. So we have things like the climbing rata, uh, kie kie, which is quite cool to plant around the places. Uh, and more Astelias as well. So this is just to increase the diversity, because if you do increase the diversity, of a bush as well, it's going to be more resilient to climate change, habitat destruction, disturbance, and things like that as well. So, and this is another site that's just about two and a half years old as well. So, a lot of uh, stuff going on there. And yeah, may the forest be with you. to know that and identify a source of a problem 
and feel like you can't do anything about it. So we want to do something, and this is something we know how to do, and we do it. It's quick and relatively easy, and we have to underestimate the complexity and the difficulty of dealing with behavior change, the different aspects of it, the people that need to be involved, and who we normally engage is um, comms and um, marketing people and designing materials rather than social scientists. So what's the alternative or solution that we can have to this? is a system, a pragmatic system that's been developed called community-based social marketing, and that's an uh, interface of psychology, habits, perception, knowledge, and social marketing, family, friends, community, and culture, resulting in behavior change. So it's really about people and working with what they have. So this is an example of a behavior change campaign using this model. It was looking at reducing uh, carbon emissions, and they focused on the behavior of idling um, in hot spots around schools, school waiting areas, so they actually looked at the benefits um, that people identified which were different. They were actually about air quality and not carbon emissions. And they targeted that campaign that way. They also looked at the barriers, which was about um, thinking that their car was going to have damage from turning it off and on. They addressed those things, and they titled it and evaluated it, and they looked at 32% reduction in um, the number of cars idling and a 73% reduction in the duration of idling. And that campaign has now gone national from one or two school sites. It's also about small things that we can learn. So the power of making things personal. By putting a post-it address to the person with a survey, there was an increase from 36% in the response to that survey to 76%. So it doesn't have to be expensive and cumbersome and complicated. It can be simple. So something as simple as, we can, can we count on you? That question at the end of a survey, a, a, a phone call, asking people to give blood at the blood drive, increase the people showing up to give blood from 62% to 81%. We care about what we commit to other people to do. Buskering, um, your example of social norming. The number one predictor of whether you're gonna give money away to Baska is whether the person walking right in front of you did. Not your taste in music, not what you like, not anything else, not your morals, not, not your political views, but what the person right in front of you did. So this behavior change approach is about localized, step-by-step, data-driven process. It removes barriers, enhances benefits, and looks at outcomes. So really looking at what we were trying to change and not, not how many flyers we distributed. Um, and it's key for us because it is about local communities. So what I'm hoping today to do is just to open this door for us to explore what it could look like if we address some of our challenges this way and how we could work aware pilot some of this stuff, try it out, learn and experiment, so we can actually come out with the outcomes that we're looking for. Thank you. So good morning, my name is Benita Gestro. I'm with um, the New Zealand GIS and Conservation. Um, and my presentation is um, entitled Geo-Enabling Community-Led Conservation in New Zealand. Um, so I thought I'd just explain a little bit about who we are and um, what we do, and hopefully these slides will just um, continue to cycle through. So um, the New Zealand GIS in Conservation, or GISC for short, um, we're a not-for-profit charitable trust. We were set up in 2012. Um, sorry, just checking the slides are working. So we were set up in 2012. We are comprised of over 140 volunteers throughout the country. Since we started work, um, we've been working with over 50 different community groups throughout the country. These um, are community groups, um, not-for-profit organisations, um, and EWI all working within conservation in New Zealand. So essentially what we do is we're providing support to groups um, to help with their geospatial needs, providing um, those technical support to communities, to groups and for-profit for organisations um, throughout the conservation sector in New Zealand. So these groups um, are people probably like yourselves who may not be familiar with GIS. So GIS or Geospatial, it's a technology, um, GIS stands for Geo Geographical Information Systems. Um, I like to think of it as a location-based information system. So it's a bit like Google Maps, but it allows you to organise your data and your information in a way that also provides access to a wider group of people as well. So it's kind of like maps, um, but just a bit more to it. So groups are using GIS to collect and to manage their operational data, to create maps and be able to analyse their work. And more, most importantly with the GIS, it actually allows you to share that information to your, your group's activities, um, to your own volunteers, to stakeholders, and also to other conservation groups. So 
It's more than just people. Sorry, it's more than just maps. It's also about people. Um, people like Parker up the top with um, the group at Mero who are doing some uh, possum eradication work. Um, people like Ara Dobson Waiteri down at the bottom who's also been helping um, with monitoring dotterel nesting out in the south coast. And collectively we're working together to ensure the future of New Zealand's native wildlife. Um, and I guess a big part of the work that we're doing is really about understanding kind of the where aspect of the work. So where are the species located? Where are people working? Um, and where can we, I guess, put most of our resources to achieve the best results? So GIS plays quite an important role, I guess, in linking the technology with the people out actually doing the work. So we realised very early on that rather than just giving kind of groups the, the technology and the software, we actually also needed to be actually be able to help them actually use the technology as well. GIS is a, um, it's a quite a complex piece of technology. You know, you, you get the software um, and then um, very hard to use. And so groups that we've been working with, just a few examples, uh, we've been working with the little blue, um, sorry, the places for penguins um, in the south coast of Wellington and also out of Matthew Soames Island. Um, we've been working with the um, Miro banded dotterel monitoring folk as well to actually ensure that we can see progress over time of eradication efforts um, around that area and also to be able to provide people with tools so that when they're going out they're actually not just collecting information about what they're seeing but also seeing what information people before them were also collecting as well. Using it to actually be able to inspire community participation, actually showing people what's happening within their neighbourhood, who else has signed up to be part of the household trapping program, who's catching things in their local neighbourhood as well. And I like the fact that my kids can actually use these tools. You know, I, when we catch them in the backyard, I actually get my eight and ten year old to actually fill in those forms for me and actually contribute. And then they get a lot of satisfaction when they see those stars appearing on the map straight away. Also working with Maratapu Restoration Trust up in the Hauraki Gulf. So they um, have a weeding program out there to eradicate the moth plant. Um, it's a particularly big um, weed, grows right up into the tree canopy, and it means that they're using effective, making effective use of their volunteers. So I guess some of the biggest benefits of using geospatial tools um, is that it actually enables you to share your information, to be able to push it out and encourage and promote participation in community-based um, conservation initiatives. Also provides um, a number of new, smart, innovative tools for actually sharing and capturing your information. Also ensures that the time spent in the field by you and your volunteers is actually used effectively so that you're actually out capturing the information once, not capturing in lots of different disparate systems, lots of different spreadsheets. So you capture it once. You can also capture information on you know, your weeding program along with your predator trapping, along with your um, local um, with monitoring information about species as well. So you can collect all this information in one system and actually look at it as um, a system of information. So um, thank you. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, support given by our corporate sponsors and members, um, our GIC committee, and also all of our volunteers um, and our supporters, um, without whom none of this is possible. So thank you. Are you going to use this? Yes. Okay. Yep. Hello everyone. Please excuse me, I'm dyslexic, so the idea of looking at a sheet of paper and then jumping up and looking at you uh, might be easier if I just simply read and um, get all the information across to you in the six minutes that I'm unable to. Off to a good start, or so I thought. On the 15th of March 2016, I held my first community trapping event. My original plan was to loan out 20 A24s that had been kindly donated to me by Hutt City Council on monthly trials to residents, at which point the traps would have sold themselves, or so I thought. However, that plan quickly came undone upon picking up the traps. Month after month, the traps weren't achieving the results the price tag and fancy marketing reflected. Trying to convince a resident to spend $170 on a trap that had on average achieved only three hits, pierced to unseen, over three months was hard. Even when the traps did occasionally achieve high hit rates, residents didn't believe the counters because they never saw the evidence. The other reality was that many people took interest because they wanted to get rid of rats, but they didn't want to deal with traps or dead animals. 
So, of course, they didn't engage with the traps. After all, that was the whole point of a self-clearing, self-resetting trap, right? People were left despondent and disengaged. I needed to adapt the plan. Meanwhile, in the forest behind Eastbourne, trapping for Miro, our local volunteer forest trapping group, I had learned how, over nearly 20 years, volunteer trappers had acted as kaitiaki to our forest and achieved effective possum control. The key aspects to their success were trap lines, regular and enthusiastic servicing, and a network of traps at specific spacing. I needed a plan that accommodates everyone if I'm to achieve a comprehensive network of traps that will achieve a high chance of being regularly serviced by enthusiastic trappers. Residential trapping for my neighbourhood had meanwhile become a hobby to me, no different to that of a fisherman or a hunter, except a much more accessible and achievable on both on my property and in my neighbourhood. This gave me the ability to learn and experience more than I would have by simply trapping on my own property. Working across the neighbourhood makes maintaining what is essentially a mainland island of comprehensive trap coverage in a residential area a very doable exercise, as long as the majority cooperate. I had a new plan. Together with the support of Miro, Hutt City Council and Greater Wellington Regional Council, we successfully applied for a round of funding from MFE. What a huge and time-consuming process this was. <laughs> Many would stop at this point. However, I have Terry Webb, who's here today somewhere, to thank, he's the chair of Miro, to thank for supporting me through the application of a 26-page document and a year of negotiations. But in defence of the process, it made me carefully evaluate the plan and guided me through the work of turning an idea into a plan into a viable project. I split Eastbourne into 11 zones and requested the help of one to two people in each zone, trap line operators or TLOs we call them. I asked them then to establish good trap coverage of their neighbourhood, whether it be through clearing traps themselves or keeping in good contact with their neighbours, or in both, as in was my case. It was up to them. ERAT would be there to support them by providing a spreadsheet of local trappers. Monthly updated Google Earth files of trap coverage, thanks to Terry, who had figured out how to put radius circles on the waypoints of Google Earth Pro, enabled us to work around already established traps and pinpoint properties in need of coverage. Somewhere to update data and upload data and show the results came in the form of GIC software. One of Mero members, Parker Jones, is heavily involved with GIC, who have generously supported and supplied volunteer labour to us. This means we have been able to produce heat maps of catch rates, which is a fantastic tool for TLOs when it comes to engaging new trappers. A monitoring exercise was designed by Greater Wellington Regional Council to complement the monitoring that has been taking place in the forest for many years with monitoring tunnels. This has been extremely beneficial as a regular and interesting exercise for TLOs to gauge their progress and has also engages the owners of the properties the monitoring tunnels are on. It has piqued people's interest and it has kept them engaged. ERAT has a, keeps a supply of rat trap and tunnel sets for TLOs to sell at cost price to people in their neighbourhood. ERAT facilitates the sale of DOC 200s and pro provides monthly stoat lure for them. HCC provides a subsidy to a percentage of homeowners wishing to purchase the DOC 200 traps and anyone over that percentage are able to purchase a DOC 200 at full cost and many people are doing so. Foreshore traps supplied by HCC and MFE funding are being installed in the form of trap lines to cover public and land between residential properties. ERAT is expected to find volunteers to service these lines and this is proving easy with more volunteers than trap lines to date. ERAT provides newsletters and trapping workshops to help share knowledge and experience with residents who are in contact and are in contact with other groups so we can share learned knowledge. Positive aspects became apparent upon trialling the system in my own neighbourhood. Not least of all, I had gained local area and social knowledge that would undoubtedly prove valuable in a civil emergency, as would the presence of a comprehensive pest control network. I had gone from thinking about saving birds to thinking about resilience, connecting communities and providing a new generation of trappers to step into the shoes of the retiring kaitiaki of our forest park. I am lucky to live against, amongst great minds, great hearts, and the project has given me the opportunity to meet and see the best in people around me, and I am enjoying it greatly.
I hope the project can benefit all, but I do not expect anyone to donate time in my direction. But I am eternally grateful to those of you that have, those of you that do, and those of you that continue to do so. I would like to make special mention to those of you that have believed sustained trapping, planting and cooperation with councils makes a difference. It has. Tuis are positively dripping from trees. And Rata Plume, Rata Bloom was abundant last summer, all because of the work you do. I thank you for your efforts. Oh, kia ora everyone. Uh, my name is Penny Fairbrother and I work in the Environmental Science Department at Greater Wellington Regional Council. So, toxic algae, or cyanobacteria to give its proper scientific name, it's an ancient group of bacteria that belongs to the Monera Kingdom. So within their kingdom, cyanobacteria are really unique in that they are the only ones that can photosynthesise and produce oxygen. I want you to remember this fact because it's a little bit important for later. So toxic algae rocketed into our consciousness in the summer of 2005-06, during which five dogs collapsed and died shortly after swimming in the Hutt River. These were the first confirmed toxic algae related dog deaths in the region and the Hutt community were shocked and appalled that their precious river was all of a sudden toxic. So why is it such a problem for dogs? Well, most dogs aren't that smart. Uh, many are also quite greedy. When toxic algae comes off the rocks that it grows on, it washes up on the riverbanks and starts to dry out. As it dries, it releases this lovely musty odour that dogs absolutely love, and many will eat it if it's given a chance. So toxic algae is clearly a hazard, particularly for dogs, but is it an ecological problem? So just because something's poisonous doesn't mean it shouldn't be there. Take Australia, for example. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> if we wiped out everything that's toxic, we'd have to get rid of half the country, as well as quite a few animal species. So in the next few slides, I'm going to explore some of the common myths surrounding toxic algae that's led to its bad boy reputation. So myth number one, toxic algae is a new or modern issue. Cyanobacteria have been around for over three billion years and were one of the first life forms on Earth. They formed these great colonies, the remains of which still exist today. These produced and released oxygen and converted our early oxygen poor atmosphere into an oxygen rich one. So in fact, we owe our very existence today to toxic algae. Myth number two, toxic algae is not a natural part of our environment. Well, cyanobacteria are extremophiles and they actually occur naturally in every environment imaginable, from the deserts in Qatar to melt ponds in Antarctica. They can even grow in the fur of one of the most ferocious animals on the planet. Toxic algae poisons the water. So it's true that toxic algae can release toxins into the water. However, these toxins are rapidly diluted and dispersed. And further, they are then broken down by natural biological processes into completely harmless substances. Algae in general is bad and it just shouldn't be there. Algae is actually an essential part of aquatic environments. It performs important functions such as providing food and habitat to aquatic organisms. In fact, many of our native fish feed on toxic algae with no apparent ill effects. What we don't want is algal blooms. Algal blooms are a sign that things are out of balance and in nature, balance is everything. So myth number five, toxic algae is only a problem in the Hutt River. Um, many other New Zealand rivers experience toxic algae blooms, including the Tuki Tuki in Hawke's Bay, the Ashley River in Canterbury, and the Hokitika River on the west coast. And even Lake Taupo, one of the most pristine water bodies in the country, had toxic algae issues this year. 
Myth number six, toxic algal blooms are caused by high levels of nutrients. Contrary to popular belief, the presence of toxic algae does not indicate poor water quality. Toxic algal blooms tend to occur in rivers with low to moderate nitrogen concentrations and low phosphorus concentrations. Myth number seven, toxic algal blooms are caused by low river flows. So this one, a bit like the Game of Thrones, is complicated. Um, it's true that toxic algal blooms generally occur during summer, when long periods of warm, dry weather create a nice, stable growing environment. However, a modelling study on the Hutt River showed that a drop in flow is unlikely to be a driver of toxic algae growth, i.e. lower flows do not necessarily equate to more blooms. So why do we get toxic algal blooms in the Hutt River? So put simply, the Hutt River is a great environment for toxic algae. Large gravel bed rivers with low levels of nutrients, just like the Hutt River, are the ones that consistently have problems with toxic algae. What's interesting for us is that we seem to have a hot spot in the Silver Stream Reach, which occurs exactly where we get nitrogen-rich groundwater upwelling into the river. But let me be clear, nitrogen concentrations down the whole length of the river are low. Using the National Objectives Framework, or NOF, which are basically national standards, all of our sites fall into the A-band for nitrogen, even the Manor Park Golf Club site, which is right in the middle of that hotspot. And is it getting worse? Well, we've only been monitoring toxic algae for just over 10 years so we simply don't have enough data to answer that yet. However, I think it's entirely feasible that toxic algae-related dog deaths have occurred in the past, but have been attributed to 1080 or other causes. So toxic algae is a really emotive issue for our communities. The question I hear all the time is how are we going to get rid of it? But maybe the question should be, should we get rid of it? I'll leave that to you to decide. And if you're interested in helping make more decisions to achieve effective and lasting water management solutions in Wellington and the Hutt Valley, I encourage you to keep an eye out for our Wellington Hutt Valley FITOA process, which is coming your way later this year. Um, so thanks for listening, and I'll be happy to take any questions about toxic algae or the FITOA process later on today in the Ask the Expert session. Kia ora koutou, my name's Alona, I work at Wellington City Council um, and I want to tell you about the wonderful world of weeds. Um, I manage weed control contacts in more than 80 sites across the city and I provide um, advice. My key, uh, at, my key thing today is it's all about the plan because um, we have heaps of weeds. You can see here at the top of uh, my head list of challenges. Um, it's quite long, right? So, <laughs> um, but I'm only going to talk about a few of these today, uh, namely ecological timeframes, um, some processes, weed ecology, and health and safety. So if you look at this photo, um, I reckon we can all benefit from looking at our site for, of what it's going to look like in 200 years. Um, it took more than 200 years to create that, um, but I'll move on. <laughs> um, so what weeds are here now may not be the weeds that are going to be there in the future. Kate McAlpine, an awesome doc scientist, um, has recently been studying the ecological processes of woody weeds, and it's what you need to start thinking about what's regenerating now and what your site's going to look, look like in 50 years. Um, so, have a think about that. will probably be in the next slide now, so I'll jump one. Um, unfortunately, the weeds we have today are only the tip of the iceberg. Most of New Zealand's um, ornamental plants were introduced after the Second World War. This means that um, they're just, they've just jumped the garden fence and they're about to go forth and conquer our ecological spaces. That leads to a phenomenon which is called sleeper weeds. 
So there are weeds that appear benign for many, many years. That's the um, red circle on the graph. Um, but they suddenly spread rapidly because of a, a, an event, and that event could be climate change, it could be a, a change in land use. And these sleeper weeds are scary, and they're really ecologically significant. I thought of a few, but I reckon you guys could come up with some more. And that's what today's all about. It's all about talking. So the cool thing about sleeper weeds is you, if you get onto them early, you save a whole lot of time and energy, and it's successful. It's fantastic. Another area of challenge is you need to be mindful of the land tenure of the site that you're working on. Most of us work in sites that have public access, and therefore we have to be careful about who else uses that space. We've got limitations on agrochemical use and our health and safety requirements. Working at the council, I get lots and lots of complaints about um, agrochemical use, and we've got to be really careful about this, that we're using the chemicals effectively, that we're using the safest chemicals, um, and that we're using trained operators. Um, WorkSafe and the regional council have put together, together new guidelines on uh, hazardous chemicals and the use of hazardous substances, so it's really important that you check with your agency what the requirements are. Because one of the scary things for me is that some vigilant can kill an 800-year-old tree. So you've got to be really, really careful. So enough about the grim stuff, right? Um, there are loads of um, things out there to help you. And um, um, so especially um, resources. So if I talk about a plan, what you need to know is what weeds you have. So. Um, you can go to Weed Busters. There's this awesome land care key that you can figure out what your weed is. You can talk to your ranger um, from your agency. They can put you in touch with the right people. And there's also um, iNaturalist New Zealand, which is the new name for Nature Watch. With a plan, you need to prioritise your threats. You need to ask questions such as what's the long-term goal for your site? Um, what's an easy win? Uh, what kind of replanting are you doing? Have you done enough weed control for that replanting? Preparing your site well is key, and this actually takes quite a long time. The site in the um, bottom right there, we've had more than five years of weed control, and we're still trying to control the bomaria. There's a number of cool things that I've learned from community groups in my time at, at the council. Um, one of them is one of the field trips today, which is um, from the fri Friends of Waifatu Stream and um, Dr Marilyn Merritt. I met her at a restoration day at Victoria University a few years ago, and her problem was Cape Pondweed. She started by understanding the e ecology of the weed, how it reproduced, where it was coming from, how it could be controlled. She got the support of her agencies, and she lived and worked locally, so they got out in the waders at a Friday lunchtime with her colleagues and dug in the stream. I just think it's gold, it's fantastic. Another group that I love is the Trilithic Park group. Um, they have a really fabulous plan. They know their site really well, helped by this really cool map that's gridded, which means that they can tell me where the weeds are and I understand. Um, and they get lots of weed buster groups and corporate groups there. One thing that I've, I love is their passion against Tradescantia. By placing it under um, black plastic and jumping on it and then waiting for quite a large number of years for it to compost down, they've even used it, in, um, it for potting mix for their native plants. So the wonderful world of weeds, well, it actually isn't that wonderful, um, but I reckon if we, we can tackle them, if we have a plan, uh, we try to view things a little bit differently, look at that 200-year time frame, uh, we look at what's recruiting at your site, you try and find those sleeper weeds, but most importantly, you celebrate your success. Cheers. Right, kia ora koutou. Um, nā mihi o te rā, ko Paul Waterhou. Uh, I'm one of the uh, pole hill protectors, and I'm going to be talking today about social media as a conservation tool. 
So um, Pole Hill Reserve is a scrappy, scrubby, 70 hectare patch of regenerating bush. It's a stone's throw from central Wellington and its volunteer trails are used by thousands of runners, riders, walkers and um, everyday people each week. It's also a meeting ground between people and wildlife spilling over from Zealandia. Four years ago, a tiaki or saddleback nest was discovered just off a mountain bike track. Um, this is Matu with his beautiful kaitiaki hands holding one of the chicks. Um, it was the first time that tiaki had successfully bred in the wild outside of, of a fenced sanctuary or, or an offshore island on the mainland in over a century. The mixture of the survival story and the unlikely urban location saw it go viral and kickstarted community interest in looking after these rare birds. And in 2014, the trapping was intensified. We've now got 160 Doc 200s and Good Nature A24s plugging holes in the gullies. Now there's over 50 trappers over five lines, from office workers to grannies, mountain bikers, mountain biking grannies. Um, this is young Lucy, who's our, at seven, is our youngest trapper. Um, the engaged group of Wellington wilder people coincided with the rise of social media and 700, just over 700 people are part of the Facebook group. And this is where Pole Hill has become a 21st century conservation story. What started out as half a dozen trappers has evolved into a digital army of Pole Hill protectors. If our goal was to lay out the welcome map for these manu taonga, people had to know about them and to treasure them. The reality for most locals was that if a tiaki was brought in by your cat or dog three or four years ago, it might have been remarked upon as a blackbird with a weird mark on its back, but soon forgotten. There was no prior conflict of interest with the birds because they'd been exiled many lifetimes before. Uh, this is a carcachick, and a few weeks later up in uh, Huntley Park over the other side of Zealandia that was um, probably killed by a roaming dog. Um, we needed to engage and to shift things from where they were, or many of these birds were doomed to be expensive rat and pet food. The Facebook group uh, has been a vital part of the project's community building. Our kaupapa was simple, show the work, celebrate the results, and totoko the people doing it. And these are two of our uh, original protectors, um, Jeff and Lisa Whittle. Some of you people who work at DOC might recognise uh, Lisa. So gallery community reports of Saddleback and Kaka encounters are complemented with a gallery of dead pests. Uh, Stoats get the most likes. With members endorsing <laughs> Trapper's efforts, and because Pole Hill is public land, we needed to earn our kaitiaki licence. Um, our job was to guide the feed so that supporters could understand the mahi, what was needed to do to look after some of these species, and see that the project had a beating heart. In late 2017, we discovered a third tiaki nest. Nests are crucial for data points for how these birds are going in the wild, and they're also a great vehicle for storytelling. Sharing photos brings the birds to life. For a punter who might be enjoying a beer or wine after school, who's not out, able to get to know them, hidden away in a mahoi cavity on a steep hillside. Each photo tells a story. Um, arguably, both the wetter and the tiaki in this story are enabled by predator control. People can invest in the animal's journey and in the science and the tikanga of what it takes to look after them. And it shows that there's a community there that cares about them. Um, they are the hands of uh, Paul uh, Scratch Jansen, who's a uh, veteran of, of Kiwi Kōkaka and Kākāpō conversation. We've got a lot of uh, board uh, doc people who are going crazy in the office and headquarters who come up the hill <laughs> and donate their experience. Um, the trail cams are also a great way of providing a reality show for your followers. And there was another couple of great examples uh, in Wellington. Nio had the Kardashians a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, Otago had the, uh, the Royal Cam. Um, they're two another good examples. And we had um, a trail cam in, in Pole Hill last year, and these are two tiaki successfully fledging. So we were able to ID uh, the moment when they'd left the nest and then tell that story. So again, these are birds hidden away. This is in a mahoi cavity. So it's a story that's not visible otherwise. So tell their story, personify them. You know, our musical awards are Tui's. Um, our world famous film effects company is Wetter Effects. You know, we're called Kiwis. The tiaki got its saddle when it had the spirit to defy Maui when the demigod was taming the sun. So when Pole Hill community members next see a tiaki or hear a tiaki in the wild, they know the bird's whakapapa. They know its attitude and they know its rarity. 
And the result, as um, I always forget if it's David Attenborough or um, Jacques Cousteau, but um, as they exhorted, it's a bird that people can experience and it's a bird that they can care about. Um, there's a comment up there, uh, the one from Zoe, this is right behind my house. And um, it's also a story that can be celebrated near and wide. Uh, this is from National Geographic earlier in the year who used it as one of their posts to launch their International Year of the Bird. And we've invited local businesses to engage with their backyard. Three years back, a whanau of kaka parrots nested in the bush behind Garage Project Brewery on Aro Street. And we swapped out a local sugar water feeder, which had a wine bottle in it, uh, with some sponsor's product. <laughs> Garage Project then posted that to their extensive um, social network on Instagram and Facebook and, uh, and ran a naming contest for the mum. Um, it was very popular and the illustrator Toby Morris drew the winner, which was Cortina, um, <laughs> to celebrate the bush bogan coming back to town. People need to care about these taonga as much as they do their pets and their stuffed toys. They grow up with Mickey Mouse emojis and Beatrix Potter hedgehogs. It's really no wonder it's a struggle to get across some of our conservation messaging for our unique Aotearoa counterparts. Our manu mates need to be a living part of our identity as New Zealanders and not just preserved in a museum display or in a Buller's Book of Birds lithograph. Um, this is Phoebe Morris who, we worked with, uh, who we've done some work with in George Denton Playground. Um, these were used for one of the playground noughts and crosses cubes um, and she's also done, these are some of the concepts we're working on for um, signage. So that's a taster of some of the stuff um, that's worked in terms of engagement for us. Um, it's inspired others. Wellington, you're showing the rest of the country what can be done. Um, wow, Wellington are exceptionally lucky. You know, but there's a lot of Totoko that's um, due here. Zealandia, obviously, for the spillover, for the years of council um, possum eradication and, you know, and, and decades of, of community engagement in their backyard. But, um, hang on a second. Um, it's inspired others and it's given the community a voice. Um, if you look at the one down the bottom there, just want to say that you and the team rock Pole Hills becoming a truly treasured part of Wellington and seeing updates like this is often the highlight of my day. Keep fighting the good fight. We started the conversation, but we don't own that conversation. You know, every one of the groups that we're involved in will have special parts of the mahi and Ask your community what they care about. Celebrate what's in your backyard and what's waiting to be discovered under a rock. Most of the Pole Hill protectors wouldn't have known what a tiaki was three or four years ago. Um, now, if your ears are tuned, it can be the dominant call on the hillside and residents post proudly about backyard visits. This is on a set of uh, building scaffolding up in Highbury. Facebook isn't the only way. Um, your project will probably be fine without it and have been for decades before it arrived. Um, kanohi kiti kanohi, face to face, still underpins everything. Pole Hill isn't digital, but a community of trappers, planters, monitors and bird nerds. Um, it's made up of mail drops, community hall meetings, garage project barbecues. Um, and it all comes back to hey tangata, hey tangata, hey tangata. We've got kids, kids. Kids <laughs> and beer. Um, <laughs> probably best not combined. Um, so I'm going to close with a, with a measure, measure of uh, shifting baselines. And, you know, we all know that sometimes community conservation can, can be challenging, especially when you're drawing on volunteer time um, and when we have other things in our lives like um, jobs, health, housing and other priorities. Um, this was an email we got from Chris Knox, who's a Pole Hill trapper and a Brooklyn resident, and he sent through um, a video with the email. Um, interestingly enough, Chris isn't on Facebook, so um, this, was, this was something that was shared, though. This, I'm going to quote from Chris. As neighbours of Pole Hill, my children have daily interactions with birds I didn't even know existed until I was an adult. My four-year-old expects to see tiaki everywhere she goes, and the second word my one-year-old spoke was kaka. <laughs> Pole Hill Protectors have helped create a space which is changing the way our children understand the world. And uh, Glenn, we're just going to play the short clip that uh, Chris sent through. Oh, hang on a second. Yeah. What can you see? <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to close with Kia Kaka, and um, 
uh, one day soon, we hope she'll be able to do the same thing with Kiwi. So, kia ora. Thanks for listening. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? Uh, my name is Karen van der Walt. I am the Conservation and Science for Wellington Gardens, and that includes the Wellington Botanic Garden and the Tari native bush. As you can see, I am talking to you about myrtle rust. Now, I'm not going to ask, has everybody heard about myrtle rust? Because I'm pretty sure you all have, and I'm pretty sure it's something you're all concerned about. So, here we go. Just going to give a little bit of background information about myrtle rust. So, sometimes you might even hear it's called guava rust, or eucalyptus rust, or myrtle rust. Now, the reason for that is when it was first discovered, it was actually discovered on guava. Um, Therefore, they called it guava rust. Then, as eucalypt species were moved around the world and in the plantation industry, they all of a sudden found it on eucalyptus. And I said, oh, no, no, we've got something new. It's called eucalyptus rust. And then when it got to Australia, Australia said, oh, it's on all our myrtles or on many of our myrtles. We're going to call it myrtle rust. That is why we're using the scientific names. So for those of you who are really interested in it, the new name is Ostropuccinia. The old name is still Puccinia, so you'll just know that I think last year it changed. It includes all of those, so it's just one biotype. What is myrtle rust? It's a serious fungal disease that affects the myrtaceae species. And quite scaringly, is it expands its host range every time it gets into a new country. And it's quite unique in, for a pathogen to be doing that. Usually you see them infecting one species, sometimes a genus, very seldom within an entire family. That is a massive host range. The problem for New Zealand is that our native species have not co-evolved with myrtle rust and therefore it, 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 it is or it can impact a lot of them quite severely. So myrtle rust, what is the story here? Um, it is the country of origin is South America and that map just gives you an idea how it started spreading. The initial spread is still debated and nobody wants to claim ownership of the spread. Um, it is suspected that it moved in eucalypt wood or eucalypt material around the world, as I said, as it's been used in plantations forever. Who, who actually initially spread it, I don't think really matters at this stage. You can see it's, it's had a global spread in the southern hemisphere. You'll see two countries, there's question marks. Taiwan, it says eradicated. Nobody really knows if it was eucalypt, uh, myrtle rust that actually was detected in Taiwan because we don't have the right data. But some of the countries did not have native Mutasi species. Therefore, myrtle rust wiped out the single species they had that was not native and therefore eradicated. No effort, human effort, has actually managed to eradicate myrtle rust. Um, Metaisi species, I'm just quickly going to touch on this. It's a massive family of plants of more than 6,000 species, and those are uh, native and non native species, which we're all familiar with to some extent. So, in terms of infections and spread, as of last week, 16 May, we were just under 700 infections for New Zealand. So, it was first discovered just quickly in April 2017 in Rao and on mainland New Zealand. May last year. So since then we've got 693 infections, uh, 49 con uh, re infections confirmed in the last two weeks. So although the temperatures are dropping, we are still detecting new finds. Uh, these are a summary of the regions and the red being the number of sites uh, with myrtle rust. So you can see Taranaki quite high as well as Bay of Plenty. Wellington is picking up, so is Manawatu. Okay, the species, leading species, this is just for New Zealand. We're not looking at other countries now. It is Rama Rama. It is important to note that it also includes uh, cultivars. So it's not only Lophomyrtus opcodata or Lophomyrtus bulata we're referring to. Um, it includes all the cultivars, and a lot of those have been in gardens and private properties. Uh, Metrosideros species, so it is Purukawa and all the ratas and all the cultivars included within that. You can see Zyzegium, it's not swamp wiry, it is monkey up apple. And you come down the list, our beloved Fijoa is also getting more infections. Three infections on Monica. Management. So recently MPI has changed the management. Um, the Taranaki control was lifted. You can move Matasi species in and out. 
And MPI has now moved on from removing the plants, so it's not a response anymore. It's a long-term incursion management. What that means is focusing on science programs because unfortunately there's a lot not known. So what is going to happen, we don't really know. What is Council doing about it? Um, we have embarked on a massive conservation program. Um, we're doing seed collection. You can see our arborists in the tree getting Metrociderus umbellata seed on South Island, um, getting all our conservation collections. At the bottom, we have partnered with the Papa. We hand pollinating Bartlett's rata and we managed to get genetically viable seed of our Bartlett's rata from a tree that was genotyped back in Auckland. We're using that seed to grow Bartlett's rata seedlings in tissue culture, so it's sterile and we cryopreserving those tips so that we can get our Bartlett's rata into gene banks because it gives us options. We also have our seed bank going um, to complement the work that's being done at the New Zealand Indigenous Floral Seed Bank. We've intensified our focus on uh, Lofumertus bulata and Lofumertus opcudata, and the reason for that is that those are the leading infected species at the moment, and we are quite concerned about what's going to happen to them. So also focusing our work on seed collection, making sure we've got genetically diverse seedlings, um, and monitoring the impact of myrtle rust on those seedlings. So I'm Maria is the other one. We're working on with plant and food on cryopreserving swamp Mari, once again to ensure we've got germplasm to work with. Um, you've heard speakers earlier about GIS. We are doing monitoring, surveillance, and making sure that data is useful. Now, in terms of restoration and myrtle rust, I think a, a couple of points to take note of is that it's likely that will take longer to establish in Wellington. As I mentioned earlier, when we use cultivars or, or maybe material that's not genetically diverse, it could be more susceptible. Plants that are in shade are probably going to be affected more than those big trees in full sun. And landscape traits might play a role. So you all go, well, what does all that, that actually means? We actually don't know. What we're saying is continue with genetically diverse planting is of Metaceae species. They are important to us. They're important to our ecological processes. But we need to monitor, because if we don't monitor, we won't understand and we can't change, can we? Then we don't know what the impact is. Fixed point photography is one of the methods that's really easily achievable by anybody, and it can show change quite easily. There's also very important information that needs to be recorded, and, and we will work with community groups going forward on how can we get this information, because if we don't have this, we do not know what's changed over time, and we're going to have this conversation in 10 years and still say, we don't know what's happening. Um, monitoring will take up to five years, so it's difficult to motivate people to keep on monitoring stuff if they don't see the results. Five years, but the data will be really meaningful. We'll use permanent plots, as I said, it's quite labor intensive, but that will enable us to do adaptive management and make sure that we include our metasi species in our ecological restorations. So the answer is not to ignore Rama Rama or Rata or anybody else if they should be in your rest restoration sites. That is me. Thank you. <laughs>